This is An American Workplace, a podcast dedicated to rewatching and discussing NBC's beloved mockumentary series, The Office. My name is Katie White, and joining me as always is my good friend and co-host, Chad Hopkins. Hello, Chad. Welcome to uh, a new school year for you. You just kicked yep. off a new year. Yeah, today was day three with kids. Uh, I'm ready to take a nap, but yeah. <laughs> otherwise I'm okay. Uh, it's... It's nice. I mean, I was telling you before we hit the record button last week or last year, I was by myself uh, in my department. And this year there's two of us in a different department and it's a department I'm more comfortable with. And so we're already off to a pretty good start. So I'm excited. How are things with you? Oh, things are fine. Summer's winding down. Fall's in the air. We've had a few beautiful days and I'm just like ready. Yeah, we're not there yet. I'm sure you're not. <laughs> but I'm not waking up at 4 a.m. either. So That was a one-time occurrence. I never planned to see 4 in the morning again. <laughs> I don't want to ever see that number and have it be dark out. Um, I'm actually heading back to Texas in a few weeks. Um, hey. Hey, but it'll be in the Hill Country. So nice and hot. I'm really, uh, right as things get pretty here, I'll just like back up to the 100 degree weather in Texas. So yeah. looking forward to it. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we got a lot of people to thank before we get started. First off, we've got four new reviews on Apple Podcasts over the last week, which is super awesome. So thank you to Carter the Nard Tuna, Madmaster1125, Stylosta, and AviJ609. We got a couple of fun usernames in there. Carter definitely has the most uh, <laughs> office appropriate, so shout out. Yeah. <laughs> the Nard Tuna. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and then we did get a Facebook review, a star rating from Victoria Hitchcock. So thank you, Victoria. And thanks to everybody who has reached out and given us some feedback. We definitely appreciate it. We're not always asking for five stars. I mean, they're definitely the ones we like the most, but <laughs> we're I'm just pretty looking partial for stars, feedback. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As always. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, moving on to our episode today, we are doing one episode because the next episode is Niagara, which is a double. So today's episode is The Promotion, aired on October 1, 2009, directed and written by Jennifer Salata. Jim has been promoted to co-manager as of last episode of Dunder Mifflin Scranton alongside Michael, who has been promoted also, question mark? <laughs> Both try to settle into their new roles with their first major assignment. They need to decide how to spend funds allocated to them for raises for the staff. Do they give everyone a little bit? Do they prioritize some over the others? Jim thinks he's ready to make the unpopular decision, but is he really? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Tune in next week. <laughs> That's it. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... As we can all anticipate, Michael is handling this super well. Mm -hmm. He loves change and he loves being threatened. So this is happening and it's great. Now, Jim, as you said, so Jim has the day-to-day -day operations. Michael has big picture, big picture and client stuff. Um, but this kind of affects both. So this is their decision. And as co-managers, they need to determine bonuses. So they spend all day kind of back and forth okay, do we give it to the salesman? Because, you know, they bring in the most money. Well, Jim's coming from sales, so that could be biased. If everyone gets a little bit, that's not going to make anyone happy. So they're just tossing this ball back and forth, trying to figure out what the right move is. Mm -hmm. And because Jim is now co-manager of the office, I thought it might be fun to sort of talk about him a little bit more in depth first, as opposed to Michael, like we're uh, want to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so... To start off, Dwight has an expense report that he needs signed by a manager. So he goes to Michael because that's who has always signed his expense reports. But Michael's like, nope, that's more day to day. I'm big picture. Send it over to Jim. And so he takes it to Jim. And of course, there's some back and forth there because Jim and Dwight still don't get along, manager or not. Um, Jim now being co in charge has the power to theoretically <laughs> streamline the efficiency of the office. And he, he tries to cut back on the frequent conference or meetings that Michael uh, typically throws around wantonly. Uh, he says, unless they're absolutely essential, we don't need to have these. Michael has a little bit of pushback at first, but he does agree. But watching Jim this episode, it's, it's almost like he has a list of grievances with how the branch has been run by Michael so far to this point. And so he's like checking off a list. Nope, not doing that anymore. Definitely going to do this now. 
this is something that needs to be put by the wayside. And so it's like he's doing what he can to correct Michael's behavior and to try to make the office more productive. Yeah, he is hitting the the ground uh, running. He is ready to discuss all these things that he's kind of had to hold onto for a long time um, and kind of bite his tongue because he wasn't a manager. He couldn't really affect change, but now he can. Michael, as you said, pushes back, especially on the conference room meeting thing. We see a conference room meeting at least once an episode, I feel like. Um, mm-hmm. And so as, as, as Jim decides, hey, this, these are huge time wasters. In fact, we're not even discussing anything office related in the conference room meetings. Um, let's just not have them. So Jim walks in on Michael holding what is not a conference room meeting per se, but there are four people discussing nonsense in michael's office so he's not taking to this very well he's not ready to change his ways and um having another person share your job with you is difficult and especially for michael um and of course michael is calling himself the senior co-manager and jim co-manager or junior co-manager so jim's not too happy about that i'm sure It's definitely an uphill battle for Jim because not only has Michael been used to having all of the power, everyone else has been used to Michael having all the power. So even though they're both equal co-managers in theory, in basically everyone else's view, Michael is still, quote, the real boss. And so even though Michael at first seems to sort of be bought in, he forwards Dwight over to Jim because this isn't my responsibility. This is day to day and I'm big picture. Uh, when it actually comes to sharing managerial responsibility rather than just sort of like busy work that falls to the manager, Michael struggles because he's never had to share responsibility before, except for when Charles shows up. So it's sort of the same reaction. He's, he, he turns against Jim basically with Charles being there. uh, Michael was no longer able to do 100% what he wants because he's not the only person quote in power. And so there's instances when Jim says, hey, Michael, can I meet with you in my office? And Michael says, sure, but after we meet in my office first. Mm. And so Michael, he, he's just struggling to, he, he, he straight up says to Jim, no offense, but when push comes to shove, what I want is more important than what you want. So he, he just doesn't understand the concept of shared power. And I think it's ironic because we see Michael be to put it frankly, incompetent so much of the time um, and just kind of lazy when it comes to -to day-to-day office things. Like we saw him pick or not pick a healthcare plan or not decide Mm -hmm. where the surplus is going to go or, you know, all these things that, hey, now he has someone to kind of pawn these things off to that he doesn't want to deal with. And now that he has to pawn them off, he doesn't want to. He wants Mm -hmm. to you know, be the guy in charge. So you can't have them both, Michael, either do your job when you were the one guy in charge or that was clearly not working. So now you have another guy in charge and and you're not sharing those responsibilities. So that's going to be something to keep an eye on, of course, um, their dynamic. Mm -hmm. Well, then they do get the the charge from David. They can no longer, at least this year, give the annual cost of living pay increase to everybody. So instead, each branch of the company gets a small amount of money to be dished out uh, according to the way the managers see fit. Um, so everybody else probably has a lot easier time with this as in the other Dunder Mifflin branches because I wouldn't think they're doing this at all of their branches with two co-managers. Uh, but that's the way things are here. So we see two different approaches. They both fight for sort of sole power over this decision. Argue, uh, Michael says, well, obviously this is a big picture decision. Jim says, well, that will affect their day-to-day living. And so David just says, I think it's a little bit of both guys. Can I trust you to figure this out or am I going to have to interfere further and basically annoy myself? Uh, They said, we can handle it. We can handle it. So Jim's approach is very methodical. Pros and cons list, which we actually saw him do not too long ago, back in Casual Friday, when trying to help Michael decide between giving the sales job to Pam or Ryan. Mm -hmm. And Michael isn't a fan of this approach because he says, you know, Jim, you think too much. Uh, Some of the the smartest people don't think at all. (laughs) Uh, 
And that's when Jim steps up. He says, you know what? I'm here for a reason, Michael, because you have some weaknesses. You are not good at making unpopular decisions. And we've talked about that before. Michael's definitely not good at making unpopular decisions. You already gave two examples, the healthcare and the surplus. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I agree, but we'll talk about how things actually turn out with these decisions they're trying to make. There is something to be said about trying to please everyone when you are able to. And so uh, that's sort of a lesson Jim has to learn in this episode. Michael goes so far as to make fun of Jim for his pro and con list um, when David trusted them to work this out together. Whether or not they like it, they are going to have to decide this together. It is both a day-to-day and a big picture thing. Um, And so they come to the decision and whether or not I agree is fairly irrelevant. I don't agree with this weird way that they came up with it, but they have a picture of everyone Um, individual pictures, rather, and they lay them out on the conference table, and they put beans on people's faces to determine their worth, basically. Uh, And the people with the most beans at the end of the process, those are the people that get the raises. What does a bean mean? (laughs) What does a bean mean? (laughs) So, of course, the office finds it, and chaos ensues. I mean, Pam notices that she has no beans on her face, which, you know, She's engaged to Jim. He has to try to be fair. Michael clearly hasn't put any down. It's just awkward all around. No one should see that. You know, the the issue of the bean system being revealed is entirely separate because it, that's Dwight overstepping what he should be doing. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Jim's first instinct is to give it to the sales staff, the money to the sales staff. And again, it's there's something to be said about trying to please everyone and that is definitely a way to not please yeah. everyone and the same thing with the merit system the merit system i think is maybe a little bit more fair it's a good idea in concept but to reiterate this these people are used to getting an annual raise everybody getting an annual raise of a certain amount for cost of living and now nobody is getting that and so instead of divvying out evenly these managers are trying to give it to some and not others. Like mm-hmm. that, that just, there's, there's so much unfair, so much, un, so much that is unfair about how Michael and especially Jim in this instance approach the situation. The way I see it, and granted, I'm not a co manager, there's only two of those. <laughs> <laughs> the way I see it, most of the, or everybody is used to getting an annual raise. They should allocate all of this money so everybody gets a little bit. Right. And that's just the way it should go. That was definitely my immediate thought as well. And I still do believe that. However, we get a deleted scene that we could talk about later, but Mm -hmm. we should probably talk about it now. My concern was addressed in that deleted scene that if they gave everyone a raise up, I think they said one and a half percent, which is what they would get, which is almost Mm -hmm. nothing. The salesman could then get peeved and leave and take clients with them. It's not worth the risk to the managers. So they decide against that because they think that a small raise for everyone is enough to basically anger the salesman enough to leave. Whether or not I think that what happened is a different story, but that's their concern as far as as far as giving a little bit all around. Right. I understand the concern as yeah. well, but but knowing the sales staff, I don't think anybody would have behaved that way, especially no. seeing how they behave when the opposite is true. Yes, exactly. Um, so I, I think everybody, I mean, as Jim says, the, these people are smart and they're adults. And in the context that he tells them that, they take offense. But I mean, in a different context, I think they are smart adults and they would have understood this is going out evenly to everybody. Right. So this is the money we have. This is, th- there's only so much we can do about the money we've been given. This is a fair thing to do. Yeah. Right. So anyways... Jim really struggles with this. Michael eventually, that th- it does eventually become a team effort rather than Michael making fun of Jim's methods. And you know, by the end of the episode, they've angered everybody. But Michael realizes, you know what? I used to have to make tough decisions like this by myself, and it always sucked. And so now it's just nice to have somebody in my corner with me. And so now, at least 
at least it sucks together. <laughs> and so uh, sort of the closing moments between the two of them, Michael goes off to his office and grabs a world's best boss mug. And another. Uh, the, another one, they both have their own world's best boss mug and he fills it with gin because it's just that kind of day. <laughs> Which I love that this all took place over the course of one day, but Michael already had that mug ready. We saw him at the beginning really, really, really not loving the idea of Jim being co-manager. And even at the end of the last episode, he didn't seem thrilled that Jim was going to be alongside him. But it looked like he was at least temporarily and ultimately willing to put that aside because he thinks Jim is also a world's best boss. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it is worth mentioning. I, I'm recalling, I think, and I may be completely wrong. Doesn't Michael have just an entire stash of world's best boss mugs in case one I breaks. don't recall that but I that could very likely like be a, true a, blue, a deleted scene maybe somewhere of him uh, oh I broke my mug let me just grab another one from this pile but in um, any case in any case yeah. I do think it's sweet that Michael decides to reach out and share one rather than thinking of himself as the world's best boss so I didn't right. want to take away from the sentimentality of the moment <laughs> but I just wanted to to say I think there's a deleted scene where Michael just has a whole stash of them which is very Michael, so. It is. If anyone knows of that, send it our way so we can, we can be sure. So that's the bulk of the discussion. There's the only other characters I really wanted to mention are Dwight. Did you have anything to say about Dwight in this episode? Very little. My first thing is that he's not wearing mustard. He's oh, wearing blue. Yeah. And I want to know <laughs> why. There's got to be a reason. He's wearing this like blue teal shirt. Anyway. Not that important, but it <laughs> maybe struck Jim me. instigated his own dress uh, <laughs> policy. <laughs> right, no more mustard. I'm sick of looking at it. <laughs> Other than that, we already kind of touched on it. He's slowly throughout the episode knocking Jim, but by the end, he's really trying to to oust him, to really get rid of him. Um, mm-hmm. But no one seems to be on board with with quite getting rid of Jim. They don't love him yet, but they're uh, they're not giving in to Dwight's sabotage. Right, and. Dwight's not the only one who is uh, skeptical. I would say Dwight's the only one who's really angry about Jim's promotion. Everyone else is sort of skeptical. Stanley uh, makes a sarcastic comment towards the beginning of the episode saying, hey, can I be a boss too? Mm. And Oscar has a talking head where he, he talks about the merits of having two bosses or two captains of a ship or multiple popes <laughs> uh, and he's got a point there, there aren't a whole lot of successful societies or organizations that do have two leaders but it's an experiment and uh, we still have yet to see exactly how it turns out it's a, off to a bit of a rocky start in this one but maybe it'll end better um, yeah. and the only thing i want to say other thing i want to say about dwight and i already mentioned it earlier him sneaking into the closed conference room where he was aware that the managers were doing business in order to see the bean-based merit system and not only sneak in to see it, but then he invites everybody else in to this closed managerial meeting and reveals it to everyone. I mean, if, if this didn't shed such a negative light on Jim and Michael just because of their methods, this would be a hugely reprimand- reprimandable, maybe even fireable. I hesitate to say fireable because uh, stress relief happened and mm. Dwight's not fired. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not Dwight's business, especially no. revealing it to everyone else. And so, uh, now is sort of when I, uh, I, I just mention that I'm not a hugest fan of this, uh, storyline that is starting with Dwight over the next part of this season. That's probably all I'll ever say about not liking it very much because this is a discussion rather than a review, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, Dwight, I, I, he, he goes a little bit too far for me in this storyline. And we'll yeah. talk about that more later. Any other characters? Yeah, a tiny little uh, B or C plot where Jim and Pam are registered for wedding gifts slash cash, as Pam <laughs> kind of hints. They are super broke. Um, this wedding, you know, weddings are expensive. So Pam is kind of going around saying, hey, yeah, our registry's up. Um, we're also accepting things not on the registry. However much <laughs> cash you might want to donate. Kevin, it looks like, is offended that she's asking him flat out for cash. And he says, you want my money? You want, my, you want me to write you a check? And she, Pam just kind of gets bold and says, yep, that, that'd be great. And so he says, 
yeah, can I write you a check? And it's a sweet moment where um, Pam sees her married name for the first time. She sees Mrs. Mm -hmm. Pamela Halbert, uh, and she kind of freaks out a little bit. Right, and I I think it's perfectly fair for Jim and Pam to be asking for money. They're prepping for hospital Mm -hmm. expenses, and Mm -hmm. the actual financial hardship of, I mean, just purely having a kid. Yeah. As well as throwing an expensive wedding and probably a honeymoon. So, uh, I'm, you do you, Pam and Jim. Yeah. I, I get I it. am not against it. A <laughs> uh, small moment that could maybe be used to transition into funny moments. Uh, Phyllis doesn't catch the hint that Pam is dropping about them wanting cash. She says, mm-hmm. yeah, we're, we're accepting things not on our registry. And Phyllis says, oh, well, I've got a cousin who makes the most romantic question mark birdhouse mailboxes romantic you haven't heard of romantic birdhouse mailboxes they're that is an industry i have not explored (laughs) (laughs) and she says you're not registered for a birdhouse are you Uh, i don't know many people who are uh really don't thanks phyllis for the the (laughs) romantic birdhouse mailboxes i guess so we know one wedding present that they're getting (laughs) to keep an eye out for two toasters So funny moments. We touched on the cold open a little bit where Dwight is trying to get his expense report signed by by Jim and then by Michael and then back to Jim. Jim won't sign it. So Dwight goes to Michael. I have a complaint about Jim. Michael says that is not big picture. Dwight says, I would like to file a huge, enormous, massive complaint about the tallest guy in our office. And Michael (laughs) kind of, oh, well, yeah, that's big. (laughs) It's a big guy and a big complaint. That's big picture. So that, that cuts through to Michael. And for, to, to point out, Jim didn't sign my, uh, Dwight's expense report because he didn't say please. He just wants a little <laughs> yep. courtesy. Just a little. <laughs> and then Jim um, finally takes Dwight's complaint about Jim. He tries to convince Dwight that he's crying. He says, if you stop crying, I'll stop writing the, the write-up. <laughs> so... <laughs> When Jim is confronting Michael about his weaknesses, Michael retaliates and says, well, why don't you tell me what those are, Jim? Why don't you enliven me? (laughs) Another Michaelism, enliven. Jim was concerned as to why Michael was holding a conference room meeting about planets, as they discussed earlier. Michael says, well, to be fair, Jim, James, Jimothy, to be fair, Jimothy, the, uh, are you okay with being called Jim? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jim says, do. yes, I, yes, I am. <laughs> In the name of, you know, co co-manager respect. <laughs> Jimothy. That's a great one. Um, at the end of the, towards the end of the episode, after things have gone terribly wrong in uh, sharing financial stuff with the rest of the office, Michael walks in and asks Jim how he's doing. And Jim says, you know, on a scale of one to 10, I'm about a four. He says, I'm normally a six. Michael says, you know, I'm usually a 10, but right now I'm feeling like a zero. <laughs> so, I mean, man, incredible nuance from Michael. Yeah. He's a, a man of extremes and polar opposites. He's Ten an or all zero. or nothing kind of guy. All or nothing, yeah. Kind of funny, kind of cringy. No, wait, just cringy. <laughs> Pam is looking into a box of donuts because it's a box of donuts. And she says, I need to fit into my wedding dress. However, I am also pregnant. So she decides to grab a donut. And Ryan says, you know, it's a myth that women have to gain more than nine pounds in a pregnancy. Look at these actresses. Some of them lose weight. Ugh. And then Phyllis just, she's talking with Pam and, and they just completely disregard his comment and change the subject to the birdhouses. They don't even give him the time of day. <laughs> yeah. And Pam eats that donut. You go, girl. Yeah. No. Always, have donut. <laughs> uh, Always another Pam and Ryan moment later in the episode, or is that the end of the episode? Ryan asks, "Would you rather have a hundred dollars now or five thousand dollars a year from now?" <laughs> and she says, "One hundred dollars now, one hundred percent. Like that's no question. I'm not going to trust you for anything. Give me a hundred dollars now." And Ryan's sort of incredulous. Instead of five thousand dollars in a year, and so all. We skip to a talking head from Pam. She says, all I have to do is give him a $50 brokerage fee. He puts in $100 of his own money as a gift. Boom, $5,000 in one year. Apparently, 
this guy has an algorithm to help determine the winner of any college basketball game. And then he realize, she realizes that's not how basketball works. <laughs> There's no algorithm. It's what team is better than another one. <laughs> Whatever. And so she just freezes for a second, realizing her mistake, her foolishness. And she just looks at the camera and says, don't tell Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Speaking of Jim, he has a talking head where he says, I've been studying Michael for years. And he learned um, enough information and, and condensed it into a pie chart called How Michael Spends His Time. He says, as you can see, we have procrastinating and distracting others. And they take up quite a large part of the circle. And then this tiny sliver here is critical thinking. I made it bigger so that you could see it. <laughs> <laughs> Stanley, when in Michael's office conference room meeting, uh, Jim walks in and says, hey, Stanley, what was the last thing Michael said before I walked in? And uh, Stanley hesitates for a second. Michael tries, him, tries to get him to not answer. And then he eventually says, if you don't smell this, you're fired. <laughs> That's uh, not a conversation I wanted to be a part of. Nope. That's never a good sign. No, no. This is sort of cringy as well. Also could maybe be a character moment. Jim's <laughs> news about the raises doesn't go over very well. And he kind of turns into Michael. Everyone's kind of yelling at him and he says, okay, let's, let's try that again. And he rewinds, like, you know, <laughs> t- takes some steps back. And Pam just cringes like, oh, God, you're turning into a manager. <laughs> I'm watching it happen. Yeah. yeah. In real time. Yeah, the I'm transformation watching. of Jimothy. It, just overnight. <laughs> uh, Kevin has a couple of funny moments. Um, finishing off the writing a check scene. First off, it's 2009 and he's carrying around a checkbook in his <laughs> jacket pocket. I don't know who. Even then. That, that yeah. We were transitioning. iPhones had already been out for two years. Move on with the times, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But anyways, he says, in the memo line, I'm going to write to love's eternal glory. <laughs> sure, Kevin, whatever you want to write, as long as it's so money romantic. for me. But yeah, the bank teller I, I love will that. smile. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, I love... The, I mean, I already said it earlier. What does a bean mean, Jim? <laughs> we hear it four times total. Uh, he, he says it like three times when in, in the conference room when it's first discovered and the conf- confrontation is originally happening. And then later, when Michael is running across the office from his office to Jim's office, we hear Kevin shout it one more time from the corner of accounting. <laughs> what does a bean mean? <laughs> Apparently nobody's enlightened or enlivened him. Enlivened him, yes. <laughs> this isn't a funny moment as much as it is just a little factoid. Michael says that kind of nonsense thing when he's talking about the plan for the raises. He says, my plan, a man, Panama. And I think it's Oscar, maybe, who says, that's not how that goes. Oh, it's Andy, yeah. He goes, that's not how that goes. What he means was, a man, a plan, a canal, Panama, which was Teddy Roosevelt, um, his plan for the Panama Canal. Which I learned was also a palindrome, so the more you know. (laughs) Yeah. Cool stuff. Uh, but another thing Michael gets wrong. So, <laughs> exactly. Um, we were blessed with two funny Creed moments in this episode. We were. Uh, the first one, he, well, I mean, to point out, Jim's new office, we didn't really mention that. There's a new office in the office, and it has sort of taken over the area where, uh, where Creed's desk cluster was. Yes, I wanted so. to mention that the architecture of this office has changed overnight. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And so there's no longer that separate desk cluster where only Creed sat and then the other desk cluster where only Meredith sat. Creed's cluster is gone. And so now Creed and Meredith are at the same cluster together. So they're sitting across from each other and uh, Creed just randomly stares up at her and asks, why haven't we ever? And she responds, we have. <laughs> and he just sort of, stares and ponders for a moment struggling to remember it seems uh anyways (laughs) why haven't we ever we have and the other Creed moment we get um oscar kevin angela meredith and dwight are all standing together in the conference room griping about the raises kevin says yeah i don't understand how they can consider giving money to some people and not the rest of us uh angela says we're in accounting and we're going to see the checks 
they just start griping back and forth. And uh, Meredith says, I'm so pissed at this company. Dwight says, mm-hmm. out the side of his mouth, he says, and Jim. Meredith says, yeah, who said that? <laughs> Dwight tried to place the blame on somebody else. He said, I think it was Creed. He was standing in the back. Creed says, yep. <laughs> take that take that blame yeah i mean i guess creed didn't remember maybe he did say it and so if somebody says he said it he's just gonna go with it just like he's, apparently he's had relations with meredith memory is not great <laughs> going into deleted scenes it starts off with a fuzzy video of jim uh sort of a talking head from his office talking about you know michael's job hasn't changed at all because he's still running around like he's the only one in charge And then it says, but today, Jim Halpert puts his foot down. And then we zoom out. (laughs) And the reason the the picture was sort of fuzzy is because we resumed it on a screen of Jim saying that thing three days ago. (laughs) And so he's in his office. He says, you know, that was three days ago and it didn't take. But mark my words, today, Jim Halpert really, really puts his foot down. (laughs) So that's any day. Any day now. (laughs) He's going to try every every day. Kevin approaches Jim in another deleted scene and congratulates him on his promotion. Jim says, thank you. And Kevin asks him to forget what he said last week, that he doesn't really do his job. And then he goes on (laughs) foot in mouth to tell Jim that he had a nap in the bathroom today. Jim just says, please stop. Please stop telling me these things. (laughs) I can't pretend to be hearing this. Please stop. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And, And Kevin says... I agree. I will not tell you anything. I will not tell you things anymore. And he, he locks his mouth and swallows a key. And he says, mm, delicious. Delicious. And then knuckle, yeah. knuckle bump Jim as he walks out the door. <laughs> um, there's another one. And I thought this was interesting to see sort of Jim as manager. Um, Andy and Stanley are complaining about Jim while uh, sitting in the break room together. Because Jim has sent out a memo asking the salesman to make 20 cold calls a day in addition to their normal sales calls with their clients. And I've got to say, that does sound excessive. 20 cold calls? I mean, that's just picking up the phone book and calling 20 people or 20 businesses. That that seems like a whole bunch to ask. And no one likes that, yeah. No. Uh, Andy says, you know, I hate making cold calls because it's it's like trying to sleep with a woman you've only known for a month. (laughs) And I wrote in parentheses, LOL, because it's Andy. (laughs) 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 That's not an unreasonable thing for a, a lot of people. Right. And he says, Big Tuna is starting to stink. And Stanley agrees. In the background, Dwight is sitting there as well, eating a peach or an apple. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but he's, he's very pleased to see everybody else sort of going against Jim without him pressuring them into it. Toby seems to disagree. We have a talking head with him. He compares Jim and Michael to apples and oranges. Toby likes apples, but he really doesn't like oranges. Oranges are annoying, and they hate him. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder which one's Michael. I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> we get a couple other talking heads getting people's reactions between choosing Jim and Michael. So that was Toby's. Stanley says, you know, Jim will answer a question if you ask him one, but Michael will imitate you for five minutes, then show you three YouTube videos, then try to tickle you, then ask you to repeat the question, then wander off and look at the clock and leave for the rest of the day. So you'd think pretty heavily in my, er, in Jim's favor. But, he says, Michael also doesn't care if you're late. So I prefer Michael. <laughs> That's one way to make that decision, I suppose. Uh, yeah. That's a Stanley Who's going to let me get away with the most? Hmm. There's a uh, back and forth between Michael and Jim where Jim accuses Michael of picking things uh, right as they pop into his head. The first thing that pops into his head, that's the answer. And Michael kind of agrees. He says, there are worse ways of making decisions, Jim. Jim barters or bargains. He says, w- would you go to Cooper's and order the first thing off the menu? Michael says... I do coconut shrimp and it, and it uh, kind of throws Jim because Jim knows that Michael loves catfish. And he says, wow, cause Cooper's Cajun catfish is really, really delicious. I'm surprised you don't get that. Michael says, what about sides? Jim says, you can pick two. <laughs> and Michael <laughs> is completely just bewildered that he has not um, read far <laughs> enough down the menu past the first item to even consider getting a dish he'd really like. 
<laughs> that that's a really good one. <laughs> that's that made me one. laugh a lot. Um, Andy weighs in on the Jim versus Michael, and it's the most obnoxious thing. And I'm not going to do a straight imitation, uh, but Andy says, "You know, Michael is the fun dad, and Jim is the serious mom, and Whittle Andy is stuck in the middle." <laughs> and this is the the rest is in a baby voice that I'm not going to do because I have dignity. <laughs> and uh, he says, and he loves them both very much, but he would probably pick Jim because he gives him his num nums on time, num nums being his commission checks. <laughs> oh my goodness, Andy! It, it, it's so painful oh. to watch. This is a grown man. And he's baby talking. No, thank you. I always, I just imagine what his childhood was like. Like, how much would he have gotten beaten up, you know? (laughs) He's like the preppy, like, yacht (laughs) club kid. I don't know. He's just such a dork. (laughs) Dwight walks into the conference room to discover the beans. He says, this is worse than I could have possibly imagined. And I have imagined some really terrible things, horrible, awful things, things men do to each other in the heart of battle that the English language doesn't have words for. German captures them nicely, but <laughs> not English. <laughs> and the, the way Dwight sort of monologues that is the most dramatic, like radio broadcast <laughs> kind of thing. Like, this is worse than I could have possibly imagined. And I have imagined some terrible things, horrible, <laughs> awful things. It, it, it's so over the top and dramatic. And I can only imagine how dramatically he like flings open the door and calls everybody in. Um, you know, something we didn't explicitly state, but I just wanted to mention it before we finish off and go into our discussion topic. Dwight, like, actually tries to to insurrect. I don't know if that's the right word. Insurrect um, rebellion. Like, he, he actively tries to mutiny against Jim. Mm. And uh, I, I, we sort of alluded to that, but just to explicitly state it, Dwight goes on, like, a rallying cry, like he's trying to take down a dictator or some somebody else in a government like he's he's really rallying to try and get everybody to take down Jim and to like drag him out of his office and it it's pretty absurd yeah uh but that just sort of falls into that so well moving into our discussion topic we touched on this a bit but i guess i just want to dive into it a little bit more um i'm not sure i really have an answer for this but let's see what we come up with we've seen how incompetent the office thinks that michael is at being a manager Why are they giving Jim such a hard time? Yeah, the bonus thing is unfortunate, but surely they have enough common sense to know that Jim did not come up with this figure. He only has so much say. Why are they so hesitant when so many of them seem to prefer Jim as a worker? I think it's the fact that they're both in power. I think had Mm. Michael moved on somewhere else, and Jim had taken over, they would have been a lot more receptive to even his initial idea to give the money to the salesman, maybe. I still think that's a bad idea, but that would have been purely Jim's decision. And it's, it, we see how people like Oscar view the fact that there's now two managers. Like, why is it necessary? Why is this a good idea? And so I think they're more opposed to the notion of having two bosses now, especially when one of them was their coworker just like a week before. Yeah. Um, and so it's more rebellion against that than against uh, Jim specifically. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Because as, as you mentioned a bit earlier, or at the beginning of the episode, the rest of, of uh, Dunder Mifflin likely is not doing this. Mm-mm. That's got to be super unconventional and very odd, especially up in corporate. Now they have a branch manager for each branch, except for Scranton, which has two. It's just, it's weird, it's, it's unconventional, and it's got to be confusing for the employees who mm-hmm. have kind of trusted Jim as a, an equal for a long time. That happened to me, actually, at my place of work. There was a girl who we had the same position, and she got promoted to manager. And it was this weird, like, okay, how do I treat you now? I can't mm-hmm. talk about the same stuff we used to talk about. So I get that. And they might even resent Jim a little bit because it's almost like, Oh, you just had to talk to David. You just had to try and get more power, huh? You weren't happy being on the level with the rest of us. Maybe a little bit of that, especially Dwight, because Dwight's been seeking after a promotion for a long time. But I I could understand. Like, I wouldn't begrudge these people feeling a little bit resentful towards Jim for changing the way things were, what Mm -hmm. they were used to, and being above them in a way now. Yeah. 
it's definitely not the end of this arc. We've got more episodes to come, but thankfully next week uh, we've got a pretty amazing episode or set of episodes that are a break from the office politics. <laughs> so that brings us to the end of the official 55th episode of An American Workplace. You can contact us at facebook.com slash workplace pod or at workplace pod on Twitter. If you care to rate, review, and subscribe, you can do so on Apple Podcasts. You can email feedback and ideas to workplacepod at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at ktlady623 or at facebook.com slash katie.white. And the best place to find me, as always, is on Twitter at chadadada. That is C-H-A-D-A-D-A-D-A. Also, facebook.com slash chad.hopkins. My other podcast is Cinescope, where we talk about the movies we love and why we love them. You can find that where podcasts can be found and at thecinescopepodcast.com. And show notes and all of our contact information can be found at this podcast website, workplacepodcast.com. Special shout out to our new Patreon subscriber, Caitlin. Thank you, Caitlin, for your support. And to all of our Patreon subscribers, you are very special and we love you. If you want a shout out and more of an American workplace each week, including access to our discussion outline and notes, a logo sticker, bonus episodes and live streams, check out our Patreon page. Pick the support level that you think is worth it to you. You can find that patreon.com slash workplace pod. And worth noting that if you look in the show notes of your podcatcher, you can see all of these links as well, or at least you should. <laughs> Hopefully. That is all for this week. Thank you for joining us to watch one of our favorite shows, The Office, here on episode 55 of An American Workplace. Make sure to join us in episode 56 for our discussion on the next episode of season six, Niagara. Bye. One, two, three, four. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs>